Trotsky came to the Bauhaus as a speaker somewhere along here. And this relates to this idea of the Bauhaus becoming the crucible, the place where these ideas from various countries and various movements were mixed together to be applied to design. Strong sense of the machine aesthetic here. A, a notion from futurism. We're living in a machine age, an industrial age. These forms reflect that. They look like they were made by machines rather than made by somebody working with ceramics or hand tools or a calligraphy lettering pen. This shows a range of Bauhaus graphics. And the thing I like about showing this slide is it shows some of the notions that are operative. The idea of using black plus a second color, once again red for its optical properties, and also because these guys were revolutionaries, and in Europe at the time, red stood for revolution, change. It's a poster for Kandinsky's 60th anniversary exhibition designed by Herbert Beyer. We see that visual hierarchy at work again. Kandinsky, Jubilee exhibition, 60th birthday. Then the other information tells you when and where. Everything is structured on an implied grid structure. Everything is cut. It's as though the whole thing is moved diagonally, shifted in the space, which gives it a tremendous vitality and balance. An advertisement for Yoko uh, Products, Y-O-K-O, -O, no relationship to Yoko Ono. This is a manufacturer of, I believe it was office supplies, if I'm not mistaken. This is by Juice Schmidt. Look at the balance and the alignments here and the distributions of weight. The way we have these three red strokes making a square. Then the Y and the strokes for the first dough make another square in relationship to that square. Note how this black typography relates to that rule, as does that black typography. Then the way that black typography has a relationship to those rules and that red type. And we could stay here for the next 15 minutes talking about the subtle, balanced relationships that this make this an organic whole, a complete design in which nothing is arbitrary and nothing is out of place. Poster by Herbert Beyer. That's what I call a focal point, that red circle, and then the information is pushed to the edges. The use of serif, serif types relates to the idea of getting to functional essences. Beyer saw sans serif types as being the pure native letter forms, stripped of ornaments, and he was thinking that serifs were ornaments, stripped of everything except the basic structure of that letter. He felt that therefore it became more readable, more rational, and had no connotations beyond its message. 1923, the German government came to the Bauhaus and asked Herbert Beyer to design some new money. Inflation was so bad that they needed to up the denominations. This is the one million mark. He also did 10 million and 100 million mark notes. I will tell you why Adolf Hitler came to power right now. It has to do with the terrible economic dislocation in Germany. And I'll tell you with a actual event that happened. A workman in Germany got paid the end of the week. Inflation was so bad, and they were printing so many of these million mark, 10 million mark paper monies, that he took his wheelbarrow to get his money when he was paid. And he piled the money in the wheelbarrow. 
on the way home, inflation was so bad that he was going to spend his whole paycheck on groceries for his family before that money became worthless. He went to the grocery store, he parked his wheelbarrow in front of the store, went in and got his groceries, came back out to get his money. Someone had dumped his money on the ground and stolen his wheelbarrow. <laughs> now, if you are a citizen of Germany in the early 1920s or the mid-1920s trying to raise a family and you're faced with that kind of economy, and a guy like Adolf Hitler gets up and starts screaming and shouting about the Third Reich and we're going to overcome these problems and so forth, you, know, you just might fall in line. And that's what people did. This is one of a series of proposals Herbert Beyer developed, uh, application of the style principles to the urban environment. There's a bus stop newsstand in the textbook. This one is a newsstand. It also has audiovisual components and advertising. The Bauhaus saw itself as a laboratory. They were working with applied problems, such as the design of printed matter, the design of lighting fixtures, the design of furniture. They were also working as a laboratory asking questions. What can a newsstand look like in the 1920s? You know, a hypothetical, theoretical problem to be addressed. Okay. These environmental graphics are by Herbert Beyer, painted in the Bauhaus building. Here's another example. This sign directs you toward the secretary's office. Note the lighting fixture. It was designed in the metal shop. We see in that lighting fixture this notion of rational functional design operative. What is a light bulb? It's an illuminated globe. OK. What do you need to hold it? You need a metal holder into which it will screw. Here it is. What else do you need? A switch, wire. What else? Nothing. OK, that's it. In spite of the success of the big Bauhaus exhibition, the political climate in Weimar continued to deteriorate. And finally, it became necessary for the Bauhaus to leave. The Bauhaus had been in Weimar from 1919 through 1924. In 1925, it reopened in Dassau. Dassau was a smaller town in Germany. and had a very visionary mayor who invited Walter Gropius to move the Bauhaus there. Here's a poster that Herbert Beyer designed. The structure at the bottom is the Bauhaus building. Note how the building relates to the photograph of the airplane as it relates to the steeple on the medieval church in Dassau, and how the planes of the photographs relate to the red and white planes. Note the placement of the typography. I submit to you that this is a masterpiece of design, taking three photographs, a few words of type, a couple of red planes limited to two-color printing on cheap paper and making something that not only successfully conveys its message about the Bauhaus and Dachau, pardon me, Dassau, technology, medieval city, modern school. It says a lot. It says it very effectively and says it with brilliant composition. This is a Bauhaus building designed by Gropius and the other faculty and the students. Gropius developed a strong belief in the notion of collaborative design in which a team of people would work on a problem with the resulting solution being bigger than what any one of them 
could achieve as individuals. This was quite a revolutionary and influential building. The lot that the city of Dassau gave them had a problem in that a street ran through the lot. So this was a solution. The building jumps over the street. Here's a diagram, and we can see that there's a workshop building, the classroom building, the administration is over the street, and then the student dormitories. All of these areas are joined together into one structure. This photograph shows the Bauhaus workshop building with this glass wall, which gives you a lot of illumination. Works very successfully for that type of environment. Herbert Beyer designed the geometric letters down the face of the building. You can see the student dormitory in the background across the street. All of the furniture was designed and built in the workshops. This is a room where you'd take basic design. Notice the Parsons style tables the name we give tables like this today. Note the bent tubing, metal tubing that's used for the stools, the student seats. Note the simple functional lighting fixtures. You want to know where modern design comes from. Modern design and all its facets was birthed at the Bauhaus. This photograph shows the stairwell. All of these ideas that we've mentioned, the notion of form following function, the reduction of ornament, or the elimination of ornament, the rational design approach, the economy of means, are all operative in this structure. Okay. This is a housing project of worker housing designed by Walter Gropius and his architectural partner, Adolf Meyer. The emphasis here was upon economy and efficiency. At the heart of the Bauhaus philosophy was the notion that we could somehow design for workers. We could use machine manufacture and modern materials to make quality utilitarian environments very economically. And when you look at this row of houses just built, you know, bear that in mind. The emphasis was how many people can we house for the budget we have? And how many square feet of living space can we give them for the amount they can afford for their housing? This is a study in modular composition of housing, a very visionary activity that Gropius led at the Bauhaus, the notion that we can prefabricate modules. These modules can then be assembled into a living unit. And the economies of scale and manufacture come into play here to reduce the cost of housing for workers. And yet, there's an adaptability to meet the needs of different families. Some people have more children than others, for example. During the years at Dassault, the Bauhaus Company was formed to license the manufacture of the products that were made in the workshops. When the Bauhaus moved to Dassault, some of the students who had completed the three-year course of study became faculty members. It was Joseph Albers, Marcel Breyer, and Herbert Bayer, spelled B-A-Y-E-R. Bayer became the head of a new workshop for typography and printing. The notion was that the workshops would take in enough business to pay for their operation. Bayer got advanced printing and typography equipment, but he had to generate enough external work done by him and the students 
to amortize that cost to a degree. It wasn't fully funded. Here's a catalog of products available from the Bauhaus. Note the visual hierarchy here, the way the typography is in descending sizes. Note the structure of the page. There's an imaginary line moving up the space here that these elements make contact with. And then there's a balancing of elements as you move through the space. That arrow is not a decoration. It's a functional element that points toward the Bauhaus in Dysaw. To get you to start there and read that first. This black L shape is not a decoration. It leads you down the space to the title. The red one under the title emphasizes the title like an underline, bends down and points down to the other information for you to read. This shows some furniture, very functional furniture, simply designed for machine manufacture to be very inexpensive for workers was designed in the woodworking workshop. Form is very definitely following function here. Marcel Breyer, along with Herbert Beyer and Joseph Albers, an ex-student who became a master, became head of the metalworking workshop. Marcel Breyer had this idea of furniture made from metal tubes as a very economical way to manufacture furniture. He contacted metal pipe companies and said, I have this idea, I want to make furniture out of metal tubes, can you give me some metal pipes to experiment with? He said, man, you're crazy. Can't make furniture out of metal pipe. You know, get out of here. Wouldn't give him any. I'd like to see the hands of everyone who has never sat on a chair made out of metal pipes. Okay. Right. That whole concept started here, a very economical way to make furniture. The philosophy behind this was twofold. One thing was to explore the nature of materials, find out what they can do. Another thing was this idea of using machine manufacture to make beautifully designed functional materials for workers. Not for the upper class, but for workers, for people of modest means. So Bauhaus was interested in the whole movement to build a new Germany and a new society based on socialism and workers and peasants as opposed to Kaisers and Tsars. This is Moholy's apartment. Marcel Breyer designed the furniture for him and did the interior work, Moholy's paintings on the wall. His chairs look very familiar, don't they? You'll find these chairs at every high school and every university in North America and Europe because they are so economical. I just ordered 13 new drafting stools for some of the CA rooms, and they cost about $30 each for a seat. With inflation the way it is and so forth, that's pretty cheap. But it's these metal tubes they're making them out of, a machine that bends them into shape, another machine that bolts them or solders them together. From a Bauhaus catalog about the workshops, this is designed by Herbert Beyer. Let's start here. We have a title that tells you that you can study in these workshops, metalworking, printing, and so forth. This bar brings you down to the list. These rectangles isolate this imported information. What's here is described here, and you come down to this information at the bottom. The horizontality leads you over into the other page where you then have a list of five important things that you need to be aware of if you're going to apply to the Bauhaus to go to school there. The old question, form versus content. <coughs> Does a graphic designer make things look beautiful 
and as a graphic designer, make things function effectively? Herbert Byer's answer to that question is, if you don't do both, you're copping out because it's possible to do both. Bayer conceived of a universal alphabet. It occurred to him as he thought through the whole problem of typographic communications that the way we use two separate symbol systems, the capital letters and the lowercase letters, is very inefficient. It means we're calling upon 26 characters in the English alphabet, I'll talk about the English alphabet, 26 characters, but we have to have 52 to do to the work of 26. Now, in Germany, they have a real mania for capitalization. They capitalize three times as many nouns as we do in English-speaking countries. But Bayer proposed a universal alphabet, a simple geometric construction such as we see here. One letter form system. Every letter was reduced to its essentials, taking care to have proper and appropriate separation. This geometric sans serif proposal, this lab work, spawned a whole generation of new typefaces. Check in your type book at Futura and a host of other sans serifs that are geometrically constructed that all were released to the market between 1927 and 1935. And they all have their heritage, their granddaddy, in this alphabet that Herbert Bayer designed at the Bauhaus. We associate Joseph Albers the third of the three Bauhaus students who became masters. And I've said that so much, I'd better make a mental note to put that on your test. We associate Joseph Albers with his paintings, Homage to the Square, in which he painted a square and a square and a square in three colors or four colors. He was very active in exploring letter form ideas, and here's a kind of geometric letter form structure that he produced. It was reproduced in the Bauhaus Journal. The Bauhaus, like Futurism, saw itself as having an expanding involvement. Like the style, it saw itself as having an expanding involvement. Not only would it be involved in the traditional visual arts, but it would be involved in new technologies such as film. It would be involved in things such as theater and dance. This is a costume by Oscar Schimmler for his Bauhaus Ballet presentation. You can just imagine when this figure performs on a black background with the legs with these black rings, the way that would look. And then with the black upper torso, when this figure twirls around like a ballerina and these sausage-like red appendages fly out in space, what an incredible visual phenomena that will make. We will pause right here and we will continue with our discussion of the Bauhaus at the next class session.